Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Elhamdülillahi Rabbil alemin. Ve salatu ve selamu alel mebuuthi rahmeten lil alemin ve ala alihi ve sahbihi ve baraka ve selleme teslimen kathiran ila yevmiddin emma ba'd. To continue our discussion about hell revealed, we're on the 16th session. Today it's going to be about a number of different types of punishment uh, in the hellfire. The first one is, which we've alluded to before, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, سَأُرْهِقُهُ سَعُودًا So the idea today is that there's going to be one punishment which is being forced to climb. Forced to climb. Over and over again. They're going to be forced to climb and then they're going to be thrown off the mountain. And then they're going to be forced to climb again. In the Sahihain, Bukhari and Muslim, Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu has a hadith in which the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, whoever kills himself with an iron, meaning with a metal, with a knife, then he will have that same implement, that weapon, whatever it is, in his hands on the day of judgment, and he will be stabbing it into his stomach in the hellfire forever and ever and ever. So that's a person who commits suicide. They are punished with the same thing, apparently it seems, that they used to kill themselves. The method they used to kill themselves within the world, they will be killing themselves over and over again and going through that pain. Then it says, the Prophet ﷺ said, whoever kills themselves with poison, he will have poison on the day of in the hellfire and he will be ingesting it he will be forcing himself to induce it within himself again over and over and over again and then the third option is given is that whoever throws themselves off a mountain and kills themselves then they will be doing the same thing in hellfire forever that's one of their punishments that they do forever. Now what that means is that if they are believers at the end of the day, they will eventually, after being purified, go to paradise. But this means that this will be one of the punishments they have. Ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu, he has a narration that the Prophet sallallahu said, when a person is killed in the path of Allah, that's mukaffir li kulli, kulli shay. That's an expiator for everything meaning expiates for all the sins a person has committed except one thing, which is generally referred to as hukukul ibad, amana, amana, responsibilities. They're not forgiven even for somebody who becomes a shaheed, even though shaheed is one of the biggest purifiers uh, to shahada, and martyrdom is one of the greatest sources of purification. So a person who has something in trust who has not paid it back, will be brought on the Day of Judgment, and it will then be, he'll then be ordered, Addi amanatak, like pay back your debt, pay back the trust that you have of someone else. So he'll say, how, how can I do that, Ya Rab? Dunya is gone, I don't have the assets, I don't have a bank balance, I don't have a checkbook, I don't have a credit card, I don't have cash. So then it will be said to him, take him to the Hawiyah, which is essentially the depths of hellfire. So he'll be taken there and thrown over, over the side, into the depths. And there he will actually find the trust that he had betrayed, the thing that he had usurped, whatever it is, he'll actually find that down there in its state. He'll then be told to carry it. So it'll be played on its, placed on his neck, meaning on his shoulders, probably. And then he will be forced to climb up in Jahannam from its depths until eventually when he manages to make it up I don't know how many years or whatever it is and he thinks he's out it will slip off his neck his shoulders and it will go back down into the depths so he'll probably have to go back to get it now it says here that this amana amana trust it's, it's in many things. Trust in terms of prayer. So a prayer is a trust to make up and if a person didn't do it, that's an amana. Amana in fasting, made up, make up fasts. 
Then it also comes in many other things. The worst of them is the one where it's something you hold of someone else, a property, an item. The next part is there'll be some people in Jahannam who will be made to just go around put, dragging their intestines behind them. So their intestines will be out and they'll just be dragging them. And the Prophet Sallallahu saw most likely in a dream or some kind of vision Amr ibn Luhay who was doing that in the hellfire. He was dragging in the hellfire. There's a hadith in the Sahih from Usama ibn Zayd radiallahu anhu that the Prophet Sallallahu said a person will be brought thrown into hellfire and then his insides they will spill out and they'll be dangling in the hellfire he'll then just be going around and round just like a donkey goes around and round one of those old mills and it's made to go around and round literally ending up where it starts and just going round and round and the other people in hellfire will gather around and say what's wrong with you even they'll be surprised about him. Each person is going to be surprised with the other one. Like, what's wrong with you? Because this person was a special person in the world. Didn't you used to tell us to do good and prohibit us from the wrong? So it's people who are supposed to be the most decent people who are preaching others. May Allah protect us and may Allah allow us to do the right thing. So he would say, yes, of course. I used to tell you guys to do the good and I never used to do it myself and I used to prohibit you from doing wrong and I used to do it myself. Abu al-Muthanna says that in hellfire there'll be people who will be tied to wheels, call that a Ferris wheel, the London eye type of wheel or he uses the word nawa'ir, plural of na'ura. And I've seen a na'ura, there's some in Homs, uh, in, in Syria, Homs, in the river Asi. This was a way for them to get water, it's like buckets or concave. So they're the na'urat. And they'll just be made to go round and round and like roasted almost like a, in the hellfire. And they'll have, these people will have absolutely no rest and no pause, nothing. The next punishment he discusses is in Surah Al-Furqan, verse 13. وَإِذَا أُلْقُوا مِنْهَا مَكَانًا ضَيِّقًا مُقَرَّنِينَ دَعُوا هُنَالِكَ ثُبُورًا And when they will be thrown into such a tight, constrained space, all shackled up, that's when they're going to call out for deaths. Just, just let me die. Because, you know, when you're in a claustrophobic even though you've got space to move, and then if it's even smaller than that, it's like just imagine somebody who has this phobia for tight spaces, for constrained spaces. This is going to be like you just cannot move, and then it's going to have be heated. That's why Kaab says that in Jahannam are these ovens, pits, very, very tight, as tight as the tip of a spear. It will feel like that on you. And they, a person will be made to be imprisoned in them. Uh, we've read about this before. Ibn Masood radiallahu anhu then has another narration, says that those who are going to be in hellfire forever, after those who are purified, taken out, those who are going to be in there forever, they're going to be placed in these coffins, some of them, right, or a lot of them, are going to be placed in these coffins of hellfire, uh, coffins made up of fire. And... It, it's go, they're going to be closed and secured over them. Then those coffins of fire will be placed into larger coffins of fire, and then that will be thrown into the hellfire. They will think that they have the worst punishment, nobody else has got a punishment. That's how bad that's going to be. And that's why in Ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu then read the, ver, 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 uh, the words in Surah Al-Anbiya verse 100, لَهُمْ فِيهَا زَفِيرٌ وَهُمْ فِيهَا لَا يَسْمَعُونَ They're going to be shrieking and crying and wailing out. 
and but nobody's going to listen to them another thing in hellfire I was surprised to learn that there's going to be 70 different types of illnesses and essentially you can just think of the worst illnesses repugnant illnesses abhorrent illnesses of, the, of this world that nobody wants and it's just going to be in the worst case scenario there so that's another that, that's another type of punishment just dealing with punishment that's why Amish quotes from Mujahid that person is going to be afflicted by scabies it's a really bad itching problem. They're going to keep scratching their skins until eventually they're going to send, scratch their flesh off and just their bones are going to show. They're going to ask, why have we been afflicted with this? Like, what's our problem? Other people aren't like that. Why have we been? Bima asabana hadha. He said, oh, because bi adhaakumul mu'mineen, because you used to trouble the believers. You used to trouble the believers. That's why you get that. That's a punishment for that. Thereafter that, there's several narrations and other things about the stench. We've had some discourse about it. But this will be so bad that others will be actually, others will be really, really irritated and harmed and inconvenienced and just in huge pain because of their smell. So it's like, it's a punishment for everybody. Ibn Buraida, uh, it's, uh, uh, the Prophet Sallallahu said, In the riha furuji ahli zina la yu'dhi ahl nar We've read this before, that the stench coming from the private parts of the people who commit fornication will be harmful for everybody else there. You're going to be known. I mean, yeah. There's another narration, it says, the people of, some people in that hellfire will be going around with a stench and said, Our Lord, what is going on? The, We've never experienced a stench since we've entered hellfire that's worse than this person's stench. A really bad stench. So then it will be said to them, yes, this is that of the private parts of those who commit zina. If this could become a reality, most of the zina in the world would stop. People could just understand this. May Allah protect us. Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Arba'atun yu'dhuna ahli nari ala ma bihim al adha Despite all of the pain that the people of hellfire are already going through, all different punishments, there's going to be four people who will add to that pain of others. So there's going to be four really bad people who are going to be contributing to the pain of others. And they're going to be going between the jahim and the hameem, the boiling water and the fire. They're going to be calling for destruction, like we just want to be out of this. So the people of hellfire, the rest of the people who are not in that punishment, they're going to be talking to one another. What's wrong with these people? Like They just smell badly. We're, it's, their stench is really, really bad. So it said that one of them will be a person that's going to be imprisoned in a coffin of embers. Another one who is the one dragging his intestines. Third one is the one who's got pus and blood just pouring out from his mouth. And the fourth one is the one who's eating his own flesh. Now, they're, they're doing this, but it's harming others because of the stench from this. So it's going to be said to the one who's in that coffin of embers, or about him, that what's wrong with him? Why is he causing us so much grief over what we already are experiencing? What's his reason? What's his puni punishment for? So now, oh, this one who's been distanced, he died while he had, he owed people money. He died without uh, essentially leaving anything to repay his debts or he had taken people's rights, or whatever the case is. He basically had unrightfully other people's wealth that he had withheld. So that's the reason why he's going to be in this closed box. Then they're going to ask about the one who has his intestines uh, dragged behind him. What's his issue that he's causing us so much problems? He wasn't careful about where the urine reached on his clothes and he wouldn't be careful about washing it off. So he's an impure person who was unhygienic in that sense. 
I mean, he may have been hygienic in the sense that using perfumes or whatever, but he wasn't hygienic in terms of purifying himself. Then they'll ask about the person who's got all of this pus and blood that's coming out of his mouth. What's his issue? Saying, oh, he used to just wait to hear a bad word from someone, maybe talking bad about somebody. He used to love to gossip, that kind of a thing, right? And he used to just enjoy it, just like you enjoy, people enjoy nasty things. Like he just was really into gossip. You can tell somebody who gossips. You sit with them for a moment and they'll bring something up about someone you know or somebody they know or somebody they think you should know, right? Or a scholar or somebody else and look what happened to him. It'll just spark off a discussion. You have to be very careful. You have to be very careful, otherwise it's easy to fall into that kind of easy discussion. So these people would love to do that. They would just take a real interest in that. A lot of people who do this online nowadays, it's become easy. You can do it without having anybody next to you, without anybody to talk to you. You can do it online. You'll find many people to talk to. A'udhu Billah. Then the person who is eating his own flesh, what was his issue? Is because he used to backbite people. He used to eat people's flesh. So now he's eating his own flesh. Or he's eating people's flesh in the hellfire. May Allah protect us from all of this. May Allah correct us. You know, some of these things will be such that we may be doing them, we don't realize we're doing them, we justify for ourselves, but we need to be really honest about this. Now, in the, in the Quran, Surah Ibrahim, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, verse 17, Allah says, وَيَأْتِيهِ الْمَوْتُ مِن كُلِّ مَكَانٍ وَمَا هُوَ بِمَيِّتٍ وَمِن وَرَائِهِ عَذَابٌ غَلِيظٌ So, talking about the people of hellfire, that death will come to him from all sides, from every place, death. He'll see death coming in all sorts. His skin is itching. He's got embers around him. There's a stench around him. He thinks he's going to die from the smell. He thinks he's going to die from the tight containment. He thinks he can't breathe. He thinks his skin is just the pain is excruciating and so on and so forth. He's, he thinks that he's going to die of thirst, of hunger, of the, of the heat. I mean, it's, yeah, th- this is, I mean, so many things. I've just mentioned a few things that I remember, but that's what Allah says in the Quran. The death will be coming to him from all sides, from all places. But he's not dead. That's really bad. It's like if you die, you just die. You know, and they say when they want to persecute somebody, they keep them alive or just about alive and they keep persecuting them. Right? They just about keep them alive. Because they're saying that for you to die quickly is actually comfort. It's a luxury for you. So we're going to keep you alive for a long time and keep punishing you. This is what they've done in many places. Right? Now, in some countries, they just kill you. In other countries, they send you to Guantanamo or other places. And they just keep you in bad conditions. I'm not sure which is worse. Right? So he's not dead, though he sees that he's going to die from so many different factors. And behind him, meaning what is to follow, is also another severe punishment on top of what he's already experiencing. Ibrahim commented on this, وَيَأْتِيهِ الْمَوْتُ مِنْ كُلِّ مَكَانٍ that he'll actually feel as if death is coming to him from the root of every hair of his body, such that even from the smallest toe of his, of his foot, he'll feel I just don't even know how to explain this and put this in perspective. He'll feel the severity of death and the pain of death from every limb of his body, including his hair and his nails. You know, when you have a pain on your nails, you can feel it, right? It's a different pain to where if somebody pulls a hair out, plucks a hair. But with all of that, despite all of that, there's going to be no comfort. There's going to be no end so that death is not going to come that he can just then just relax in nothingness. Okay, next section he has is about disbelievers and how their punishment is going to be just continuous. So he says, لا يفتر عنهم, لا ينقطع, لا يخفف. It's not going to be lightened, it's not going to cease, it's not going to pause, there's going to be no respite. 
Allah says in Surah Al-Zukhruf, verse 74-75, إِنَّ الْمُجْرِمِينَ فِي عَذَابِ جَهَنَّمَ خَالِدُونَ لَا يُفَتَّرُ عَنْهُمْ وَهُمْ فِيهِ مُبْلِسُونَ The wrongdoers will be in the punishment of the hellfire forever. It will not be stopped. It will not be paused on them. No respite. And they'll be in there totally despondent. Then Allah says in Surah Fatir, verse 36, وَالَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا لَهُمْ نَارُ جَهَنَّمْ لَا يُقْضَى عَلَيْهِمْ فَيَمُوتُوا وَلَا يُخَفَّفُ عَنْهُمْ مِنْ عَذَابِهَا those who disbelieve for them is the hellfire, punishment of the hellfire. They won't be finished off so that they die. No decree will be made for them that they just be ended. But it will also not be lightened upon them, the punishment. Then Allah says in Surah Al-Baqarah verse 86, فَلَا يُخَفَّفُ عَنْهُمُ الْعَذَابُ وَلَا هُمْ يُنصَرُونَ Punishment will be not made any lighter upon them and they will not be assisted, protected, defended. Allah says in Surah Al-Ghafir 49.50 verses, وَقَالَ الَّذِينَ فِي النَّارِ لِخَزَنَةِ جَهَنَّمْ أُدْعُوا رَبَّكُمْ يُخَفِّفْ عَنَّا يَوْمًا مِّنَ الْعَذَابِ The people in hellfire will be saying to the gods of hellfire, just call to your Lord that our punishment can be lightened upon us for just one day in Jahannam. قَالُوا أَوَلَمْ تَكُوا تَأْتِيكُمْ رُسُلُكُمْ بِالْبَيِّنَاتِ didn't your messengers used to come to you with clear signs and evidences to show you what the right way is? Qalu bala, of course they did. Qalu fad'u. So why don't you call yourself then? Wama du'a'ul kafirina illa fi dalal. But the calls and pleas of the disbelievers aren't going anywhere. They're just going to be lost. There's nobody to listen to them, nobody to hear. Ahmad ibn Abil Huwara says that I once heard Ishaq ibn Ibrahim while he's on the pulpit of Damascus, the main masjid of Damascus on the pulpit. He was giving a khutbah, a bayan, a lesson. He was saying, لا يأتي على صاحب الجنة الساعة إلا وهو يزداد ضعفا من النعيم لم يكن يعرفه. Not a moment will come empty on a person who's in paradise except that he'll be given something in addition to what he's already known. So that's what happens in punishment, in, in paradise. What happens in paradise is that every moment is a new joy. So you eat an apple of paradise, if that's going to be the, a fruit there, and the next time you eat it, it's going to be a new joy. You go strawberry picking some really nice strawberries, and you pick, you know, three kilos or whatever, eventually you get tired of them. But they were really nice when they started. But in paradise that won't happen because you get a new experience with each one. Then he said, but that's the same issue opposite for the hellfire, that people in hellfire, they won't have any empty moments. Right? Except that they're going to find the next punishment, the next sensation of punishment, something different to the previous one. So you can't even get used to it. Can you see how deep this is? There's going to be no getting used to the punishment. There's going to be a new sense of pain with each subsequent punishment because generally people get used to punishment. Their skin becomes tough when they get beaten. I mean, these guys who do a lot of training, you know, they keep punching, punching until, um, you know, the skin becomes hard enough or whatever the case is. Or any other thing, you get beaten, 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 they become uh, quite tough in that regard. But here, it's, it's there for the, for, the, for the pain. So there's no way to escape. There's no getting used to it. That's why Allah says in Surah An-Naba, verse 30, فَذُوقُوا فَلَنْ نَزِيدَكُمْ إِلَّا عَذَابًا You taste, taste it, experience it. We're only going, we're surely going to increase you in punishment. So it might look like the same, but it's going to give a renewed type of pain, a different type of pain. Once Hassan relates that I asked Abu Barza um, about the most severest verse in the book of Allah about, uh, for people of hellfire. So he said, oh, I heard the Prophet ﷺ reciting this verse, which is uh, Surah Al-Nabat, verse 30, taste, we're only going to, 
we're definitely going to increase you in punishment. That's the only way we're going to increase. Now, you know what the worst punishment in the hellfire is? Out of everything we've been reading, what do you think the worst punishment of the hellfire is? I mean, it's difficult to determine, but they actually say that the worst of the punishments for the people of hellfire is that they will be veiled from Allah. That's going to be the worst. Because by that time, they're going to recognize everything. They're going to realize what they're missing. And then they're going to realize that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is their creator. And that sensation is going to be worse than anything else. It's almost like they're going to be given that emotion. That's going to be the worst punishment. Allah will not speak to them, will not look at them, and just completely dismay. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is so merciful that if He looks at someone, if He allows Himself to look at someone, He, mer- he has mercy on them. That's why He says that, وَلَا يَنْظُرُ إِلَيْهِمْ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامِ Many hadith, you know, that puts in perspective. Why won't Allah look at them? Because Allah is so compassionate. That if he was to look at someone and then they're in this pain or whatever, he will forgive them. He will have mercy on them. So he won't even look at them. He'll be angry on them and that anger will lead him not to look at them. Just as we know that in paradise, it's all parallel by the way. Just as in paradise we know that one of the highest, um, after enjoying everything and being given whatever you want in paradise, when Allah says, I'm going to be happy with you and never be dissatisfied with you again, never be angry with you again, I think, oh wow, that's going to increase. And then on top of that, we'll be seeing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's going to be the best source of pleasure that they have. So likewise, the opposite here is that punishment, punishment is bad enough. But when, they, when Allah doesn't want to look at them, hear them, speak to them, whatever, it's going to be even worse. So, these are the verses. Surah Al-Muttafifin. كَلَّا بَلْ رَانَ عَلَىٰ قُلُوبِهِمْ مَا كَانُوا يَكْسِبُونَ كَلَّا إِنَّهُمْ عَنْ رَبِّهِمْ يَوْمَئِذٍ لَمَحْجُوبُونَ ثُمَّ إِنَّهُمْ لَصَالُ الْجَحِيمِ ثُمَّ يُقَالُ هَذَا الَّذِي كُنْتُمْ بِهِ تُكَذِّبُونَ So the first verse discusses that there's going to be this rust that overcomes their heart because of what they used to do and earn and perpetrate. They're going to be arrabbihim. They're going to be completely veiled from their Lord on that day. That's a punishment. Otherwise, why would Allah mention it? You know, if they were such that, oh, we don't even want to see him. That would not be something worthy of mention. Right? Who wants to see their jailers? They don't. Nobody wants to see their jailers. But here they'd want to because they know that he can do something for them. But they won't be given that opportunity. Then they're going to be entered into the hellfire. They will enter hellfire. And then it will be said to them that this is what you used to deny. This is what you used to deny. So in this verse, Allah has mentioned three types of punishments. One is Allah is being veiled from them. Then them entering the hellfire. And then after that, them being basically censored. That you, this is, remember, this is what you used to look at it. You've got it now. This is what you used to deny. And then Allah also mentions in the Quran that they'll be, their hearts will be rusted over in the world. That which has basically made black their hearts so that none of the good stuff eventually reaches them because of what they're doing unless they work very hard and Allah can forgive them for it in this world. So just like Allah is then veiled from them in the world, they veil themselves from Allah by doing the sins. They've put up a veil, they've put up the darknesses. Likewise, they're going to be veiled from Allah in the hereafter. That world is a reflection of this world. That world and everybody knows what's in their hearts. Where they, where, whether they have qualities of different animals, predatory qualities, uh, various different haram desires and so on, that, that's what they're going to see on themselves in the hereafter. Now that's very different from the people of paradise, as Allah mentions, لِلَّذِينَ أَحْسَنُ الْحُسْنَى وَزِيَادَةً وَلَا يَرْحَقُوا وَجُوهَهُمْ قَتَرٌ وَلَا ذِلَّةً Surah Yunus verse 26. Those who've done good, the doers of good, for them will be good, a goodly reward. And ziyada, and more on top of that. So the goodly reward, that's paradise. And the increase on that, Allah's satisfaction, Allah's sight. And their faces will never be overcome by disgrace and darkness and clouded and so on. So the people who do ihsan, right, they are ahlul ihsan. 
And as the Prophet ﷺ discussed, Ihsan is worship Allah as though you see Him in this world. That's what we've been told, right? That famous hadith of Jibreel salam that you worship Allah as though you're seeing Him, or as though He's seeing you, as though you're conscious of Him. You know, that's the kind of understanding. Well, that's the kind of the same thing, that then you'll be able to see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the hereafter. If you do your worship and act in this world as though you are seeing Allah, then Allah will let you see Him in the hereafter. That's what we get from that. So, Jaza'ul Ihsan is Al Husna, wa huwa Al Jannah, wa Ziyadah, wa hiya Nazar ila wajhillahi azza wa jal. Ja'far ibn Sulaiman is the one who's trying, he said that I heard Abu Imran al Jawni remark, Inna Allah lam yanzur ila insan in qattu illa rahimahu. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if he ever looks at an insan, he loves insan so much that he will have mercy on them. Walau nazara ila ahlin nar la rahimahum. Was he to look, if he was to look at the people of hellfire, he would have mercy on them. But then he's just made a decision, he's not going to look at them. That's why it's related that the people of hellfire will say, Ilahana, irda anna. Our Lord, just be satisfied with us. Right? Now, this is what Ahmad ibn Abi al-Huwara has transmitted from Ahmad ibn Musa, from Abu Maryam. I'm just mentioning this for a reason, right? So... Abu Maryam has said this, that the people of hellfire will say, Our Lord, be satisfied with us. Just be happy with us. Then you can punish us with whatever you want of the punishment. Like punish us with all of this, but you just be satisfied with us. Because your anger, knowing that you're angry with us, is actually more severe on us than the punishment that we're experiencing. Now, this isn't a hadith or anything. This is what a comment that somebody made, this Abu Maryam made. So Imam Ahmed, I think, he said, I transmitted this comment to Sulaiman ibn Abi Sulaiman. And Sulaiman said, no, this cannot be from one of the disbelievers of hellfire. This isn't something that they would ever think about. This, mu- this was a difference. I mean, like, who is this talking about? What kind of people of hellfire is this talking about? This must be the words of those who obey Allah. So then he said that I asked this to Abu Sulaiman, which is his father. And he said, yes, Sulaiman has told the truth. Uh, and this is Sulaiman, the son of Abu Sulaiman al-Darani, rahmatullahi alayhi, right? was arifan, was a major wali of Allah. Right? Kabir, al- Kabir al-Qadr, a very high position, rahimahullah. That yeah, what he's saying is the truth. Because the people of hellfire, meaning those who are there forever, they're going to be juhal, they don't know Allah. Right? So they would not say this. They wouldn't have the inspiration to say this. They, don't know, they, they recognize that they, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't like them and they would like Allah to like them, but they don't know enough about Allah to say that, let at least ask Him or think about it. Do you understand? It's difficult it's, uh, because that's why knowledge of Allah helps. It will help us in this world, help us in the hereafter. Even if that's in his heart, he won't be able to ask this. Because the only person who knows this, this is like a weak spot. It's, Allah doesn't have a weak spot. But it is that when somebody asks him, he likes it. Right? They won't know that. So he's saying that maybe this is of those who are Muslim, who are believers, who are muwahideen, monotheist from all nations who do have to enter hellfire for a reason, then this is one way that they will get an escape from it. By saying this, eventually it'll be uh, when Allah wills, this will be an inspiration they'll get and then they'll say that. Because there will be people who will be saved from the hellfire, right? The believers from different nations. Because some of them will actually seek refuge in Allah. Some will seek refuge from other good people and then they'll be taken out into session and so on. Abu al-Abbas ibn Masruq said that I heard Suwaid ibn Sa'id saying that I heard Fudayl ibn Iyad, Abid al-Haramain saying, a person will be made to stand in front of Allah Azza wa Jal. He has no good deeds. Zero. He's just a believer maybe. He is in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah will say, Go. Subhanallah, this is such a beautiful hadith, such a beautiful hadith, such a beautiful hadith. He'll say to that person, 
go, do you know any salihin? In, in your life, did you connect with any salihin? Were you in contact with any righteous people? Right? Do you know anyone who can seek forgiveness for you? So, I will forgive you if you know them. Allahu Akbar. I'm going to forgive you if you know them. So, he can't remember. He wasn't really in touch, but he thought, let me try. So, he goes around for 30 years looking at people. Do I recognize anyone? He doesn't recognize anybody that he knows. He recognizes no one. He knows no one of the Sadiheen. So then he comes back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya Rabb, I didn't see anybody. I just wasn't in that kind of crowd. I used to hate them. Or oh, I don't know, whatever. Right. Maulanas are like this. Shuyukh are like this. Scholars are the worst scum on the earth. They're petro, dot, petro scholars. I don't know what people say. I have these weird ideas. Some. You know. I don't see anybody. So Allah will say, okay, take him to hellfire. And this is amazing. This is uh, of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's mercy. So the Zabaniya, these are the angels of hellfire who will drag him to the hellfire. They're dragging him, they've grabbed him and they're dragging him and said, my Lord, my Lord, if you are going to forgive me just because of my association with some of your creatures, you know, the Salihin is at the end of the year, your created being and you are willing to forgive me if I knew somebody, then by your oneness, you are more entitled to forgive me. You know, you are more befitting that you forgive me for yourself, from yourself, not because of somebody else. If you're going to forgive me for that person, what about you yourself? Your mercy, your generosity knows no bounds. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will then say to these, these angels, Ruddu arifi. Bring this knower of me back. This person knows me. That's all Allah wants from us. He wants us to know him. So even this person, after he's been, you know, whatever, Allah will eventually forgive him because of just knowing Allah. Because Allah created us, He created the world and everything for us, and we don't know Him. That's the one of the biggest things. Because He used to know me. And then shower him with my honor and the gifts of my honor and then let him go and enjoy in the Riyadhul Jannah when Allah starts giving he goes let him then go and enjoy because he knows me and I am known to him these was amazing may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us goodness may Allah give us of his greatness Right, now, what is there in store for people in hellfire as soon as they go in? What is the, as they say, the hospitality that's provided that they prepare? They do that in prison, they have maybe some garments and, you know, whatever, you know. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in Surah Al-Waqi'ah, verse 51 to 56, ثُمَّ إِنَّكُمْ أَيُّهَا الضَّالُّونَ الْمُكَذِّبُونَ لَآكِلُونَ مِنْ شَجَرٍ مِنْ زَقُّومٍ فَمَالِئُونَ مِنْهَا الْبُطُونَ فَشَارِبُونَ عَلَيْهِ مِنَ الْحَمِيمِ فَشَارِبُونَ شُرْبَ الْهِيمِ هَذَا نُزُلُهُمْ يَوْمَ الدِّينِ We've read this before. That these are the people they're going to be eating from the tree of Zakum. They're going to be filling their stomachs with it, even though it's so thorny and so ugly and so unnourishing. Then they're going to be forced to drink boiling water above it and they're going to drink it. And then Allah says, This is their nuzul. What does nuzul mean? This is their nuzul on that day. Nuzul means hospitality. This is what they prepare for your guests. It's the concept of nuzul. That's why there's this hotel in Medina Mon, it's called Nuzul. You just spell it weird. Nuzul. N-O-Z-O-L. Should be N-U-Z-U-L. Nuzul. Because that's what the Arabic word is. So that's what they're going to have on offer. The zakum and the hot water. The boiling hot water. And that's because, why are they going to drink it? 
Because they're going to be thirsty. That sun is going to be very close on the Day of Judgment. So when they get into hellfire, they're going to want something to drink. Because they've not been given anything to drink on the Day of Judgment. They're going to be emaciated, totally dehydrated. So they're going to want to drink it. That's why Allah said in Surah, Mar- Surah Maryam, verse 86, وَنَسُوقُ الْمُجْرِمِينَ إِلَىٰ جَهَنَّمَ وِرْدًا We're going to drag them, these wrongdoers, to the, uh, to the hellfire. So, Abu Imran al-Jawni says that they're going to be brought in such a state of thirst and that he used this verse of Surah Maryam. So, it's like, they're, you know when you're completely parched and you feel dry as though you're going to crack up because of intense thirst in your throat? Like you can't even speak properly, it's going to be really, really bad. So they're going to want to drink anything. That's why Ayyub relates from Hassan Basri, rahimahullah. مَا ظَنُّكَ بِقَوْمٍ قَامُوا عَلَىٰ أَقْدَامِهِمْ خَمْسِينَ أَلْفَ سَنَةٍ لَمْ يَأْكُلُوا فِيهَا أُكْلَةٍ وَلَا يَشْرَبُوا وَلَمْ يَشْرَبُوا فِيهَا شُرْبَةٍ وَالشَّرْبَةٍ حَتَّى انْقَطَعَتْ عَنَاكُهُمْ أَطْشًا What do you think about a people who've had to stand on their feet for 50,000 years? They've not been able to eat anything, nor drink anything. How are they even going to be alive? That's the thing. You don't die, right? Death is not so easy down there. In fact, death doesn't occur. There's no death in paradise. Allah has then just seized death. There's no death in paradise and there's no death in hellfire. That's where it is. Death relates to this world, so we just have to take death out of our minds. The reason we think that they're going to die eventually is because we have death in this world ingrained. That's our disposition. We know people die. We know everything gets reduced to nothing. But there is no death there. So death is not even in the vocabulary. Death does not exist. So that's why they're going to be standing for 50,000 years, not eating, nor drinking anything until they are absolutely just dried and cut up and so on. And their stomach is just burnt. Right? Then they're going to be taken to the fire. And then they're going to be willing to drink that hot stuff. So that puts it in perspective. There's another... Uh, statement about more in detail that when a person is thrown into hellfire he's going to start falling down eventually he gets to one of the levels of hellfire and then he's going to be talking okay this is your place until we bring you your your hospitality your your food so he'll be then given first poison of the the various different poisonous animals in hellfire and by that the flesh will be separated from his from the bones and the hair will come off and the muscles will dangle and his veins will be separated so it's going to be really 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 toxic la ilaha illallah now he's talking about the shrieks of the people of hellfire there's a few things about that a number of verses actually allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in surah al-anbiya verse 100 لَهُمْ فِيهَا زَفِيرٌ وَهُمْ فِيهَا لَا يَسْمَعُونَ We read that already, they're going to be shrieking and shouting in there. Then in Surah Hud 106, we didn't read that today. فَأَمَّا الَّذِينَ شَقُوا فَفِي النَّارِ لَهُمْ فِيهَا زَفِيرٌ وَشَهِيقٌ شهيق. uh, Those who are unfortunate and wretched, they're going to be in hellfire and for them is going to be all of this screaming and crying and everything else. So what's the difference between zafir and shahiq? Allah uses both words. They're going to be doing zafir and shahiq. So, Rabi ibn Anas says, zafir is in the throat. It's a sound that comes from your throat. And shahiq is a sound that comes from the heart. So it's going to be so hoarse that you, you can't even bring the sound from the throat, maybe when that ends. Or there's a double sound that comes from the heart as well. Some say that it's going to be like the sound of the donkey that it starts off as a zafir and the end is a shahiq. Now, I've not listened to a donkey in a very long time, so I can't relate to this, but I'm sure if you check online, it'll probably, probably tell you how, how that happens, if you want to get an idea. That's why Allah said in Surah Al-Fatir, verse 37, وَهُمْ يَسْتَرِخُونَ فِيهَا They're going to be shrieking, making these noises in there. لا إله إلا الله لا إله إلا الله لا إله إلا الله There's a hadith um, according to some, it's from the Prophet according to some, it's actually one of the Sahabi who said it, Anas The people of Hellfire will also cry. 
There's no, so we never spoke about crying yet. We saw talking about shrieking and making noise. This is crying. They will cry so much that they'll have no tears left. Then they will cry tears of blood. Right? I'm not sure how medically or biologically that happens, but they're going to cry tears of blood. When they cry tears of blood, it says, now remember, they're going to be massive, right? One tooth of theirs is going to be like Mount Uhud, and they're going to be expanded to some huge, gigantic state, right? So because of their crying, it's going to create rifts in their face. There's going to be various different valleys and rifts created in their face, Uhdud, such that if you were to send boats through it, they could, they could basically fit into them. It's going to be crazy. There's another verse in Surah Ibrahim. So in explanation of that, Zayd ibn Aslam says, they're going to be patient for a hundred years. They're going to cry for a hundred years. But it makes no difference. If they think that I can just say nothing and I'll, something good will happen to me, if I cry something, no. It's the same for us. Whether we cry, whether we're patient, whether we cry, whatever, it makes no difference. Okay, this is a beautiful dua. That the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Abdullah ibn Masood Abdullah ibn Umar radiyallahu relates that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would make this dua. It's in the al-hizb al-a'ram. Allahumma rzuqni aynayni hattalatayn yashfiyani al-qalb bithuruf al-dumu' min khashyati qabla an yakuna al-dam'u Daman wal adrasu jamran. What does this hadith mean? What does this dua mean? Grant me such eyes which cry. When your eyes cry for the right reason, they, there's an amazing, you can say, connection between the eyes and the heart. Because you know when you feel at lost in your heart, when you feel emotion in your heart, you cry. You feel excited, you cry. Right? So the tears and the eyes have, and that's why Allah loves tears that are shed out of the fear. Where do you feel the fear? In the eyes? In the heart. You know, the heart and brain is where you feel the fear, but your heart cries. So that's why he's saying that, Oh Allah, grant me eyes that do cry, that then cure the heart with, you know, abundant tears from your fear. Before the tears become blood, and the tooth become embers. The teeth become embers. The gums become embers. So, Ameen, to this dua. Uh, it's related from Ismail ibn Ubaidillah. He says, Dawood alayhi salam said, Oh my Lord, again, same dua. Urzukni aynayni hattalatayn yabkiyani bithuruf al-dumu'i wa yushfiyani مِنْ خَشَّتِكْ قَبْلَ أَنْ يَعُودَ الدَّمْعُ دَمًا وَالْأَدْرَاسُ جَمْرًا So it's similar, similar words to the previous one, same meaning. And Dawood alayhi salam used to be censored by his close ones that why do you cry so much? يُعَاتَبْ فِي كَثْرَةِ الْبُكَاء So he would say that leave me alone, I cry before the day comes when people have to cry. When, you know, in the hereafter before the angels are commanded you know, to, to deal with the human beings. Another thing he would say is that I cry before the day comes when crying will be of no benefit. And then he actually says, this is related from him, that he would then call for an ember, he would place his hand on it until he could feel the heat, and then he would raise his hands. And then he would say, oh, what a punishment. That's a very bad punishment as compared to, you know, the punishment. He's trying to feel the punishment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There's quite a few narrations about Yaqub, uh, about Dawood alayhi salam doing this, about punishment. He would really lament about it. Then Ka'b, he relates that Ibrahim alayhi salam, as Allah says in the Quran, Ibrahim halimun awahum munib. Ibrahim alayhi salam was a very forbearing person and he was person who constantly remembered these things and was constantly returning to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, whenever he would remember the hellfire, he would say, 
Awah min an nar. He would lament about the hellfire. He would seek uh, uh, protection from it. Once Rayah al Qaisi was passing by a little child, and that child was crying. So, I don't know, he started asking, like, Why are you crying for? Sometimes you see children crying. Why are you crying for? My son, why are you crying? The child couldn't answer him. La yuhsin yujibu. He didn't respond to him in any way. He just couldn't. He just kept crying. So Rayyah began to cry. Why did he begin to cry? He said, Laysa li ahlin nari raha. He says, even for the people of hellfire, there'll be no comfort, no escape, except just crying. So he started crying as well. He remembered the people of hellfire. On another occasion, maybe this was the same occasion, he says that he was actually at somewhere and somebody, one of the children started crying at night. So he started crying and he cried until the morning. They asked him, why did you cry until the morning? He said, well, he just made me remember the people of hellfire, that they're going to have nobody to help them in the hellfire. This kid, nobody was looking after him. This kid was crying, there was nobody to comfort him. The people of hellfire, there's nobody to comfort them either. So I started crying as well. May Allah give us such shu'ur and such consciousness such sensitivity, such concern, and such preparedness of the hellfire. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us. May Allah accept these classes, accept this study of this book, and make it a source of protection for us. That's all we got to show. We don't have too much to show. May Allah accept us and make us of the righteous ones. Wa akhiru da'wana and alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Jazakallah khair for listening. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, bless you. And if you're finding this useful, you know, um, as they say, do that like button and subscribe button and forward it on to others. Jazakallah khairan. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.